A pleasant greetings to all of my brethren who have joined us to present you to Seven Year Adventists to share and to listen with us through the Sabbath school lesson. My name is Sister Cherry, and we have the usual team that comes each week, which is Brother Brian, Brother Bond, and Sister Akins. We are all here to share with you, and we are here to learn from you also. So we are looking forward to to receive your comments or questions in the comment box. This week, we are dealing with the topic, understanding human nature. Can we understand human nature? Our memory verse is taken from Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, which says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into the nostril the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So this is what really sums up the week as we go through Genesis chapter 1 and as we go through Matthew, Ecclesiastes, 1 Kings and all these texts. It all surrounds man and the dust and the breath of life and the soul. And this is what this week is based on. They say that the tension between God's word, you shall die and Satan's counterfeit promise, you shall die not die, was not restricted to the Garden of Eden. It has echoed throughout history. And we have seen that, brethren, how it has echoed throughout history. We have learned even from last week of what Satan has done in the Garden, how he used the serpent as a medium to which he deceives Eve. He had not even come himself in his own form. He came through a medium. And that's what has been happening all throughout history. Many people try to harmonize the word of Satan with the words of God. For them, the one in you shall not die refers only to the perishable physical body. While the promise you certainly will not die is an allusion to a mortal soul or spirit. So who do we believe? And we are going to go in to the lesson and see what God has to say concerning you shall not die what it means you know the is there a mortal soul when you die is it that the body goes back to the dust and there is a soul somewhere as some believe it comes back into the form of an animal or some believe it it has gone to heaven and they are looking down all of these things we are going to cover today but just before we go forward we're going to have our opening prayer in which i'm going to ask brother barn please can you take us through that prayer Our loving and heavenly Father, as we come to you this morning, not because we are good, but because of your righteousness and your holiness, because of your redeeming grace, that you have called us out of darkness to walk in your mar in your marvelous light. We pray your spirit this morning to be with us, that you will teach us your way. Help us to humble ourselves at the cross, that you will manifest your spirit in us, through us, to carry out your work here, Lord. May your name be glorified. We pray for the ones that will speak. We pray your spirit will speak through them. Inspiration. May your name be glorified. We thank thee so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Brother Barn. Now we're going to go over a bit into Sabbath lesson. You know, what we're going to see what inspiration tells us because we know what the writings of the spirit, spirit of prophecy does for the word of God. We know the word of God is the greater light and this is the lesser light. But what happens? In order for us to have a full understanding of the greater light, God has given us a lesser light and we're going to see what the word of God has for us today. So I'm reading from the book Ministry of Healing. And here's what it says concerning the human body. It says the mechanism of the human body cannot be fully understood. It presents mysteries that baffle the most intelligent. It is not as the result of a mechanism, which once sets in motion, continues its work, that the pulse beats and breath follows breath. It, in God, we live and move and have our being. The beating heart, the throbbing pulse, every nerve and 
muscle in the living organism is kept in order and activity by the power of an ever present God. So human beings, they have, there is no human being on earth who have ever created another human being. Robots here, they have created other things to replace what some, you know, what human beings can do. But nobody has ever created human being. And this is what inspiration is saying. It cannot be fully understood unless you yourself create it. It cannot be fully understood. If you create a machine, you can tell how it works. But we didn't create this body. God created it and only he alone can tell us what to do, how it works. And this is why inspiration reminds us that God is the one who has set in motion this body, every heartbeat, every muscle, every pulse. Satan is an expert in quoting scriptures, placing his own interpretation upon passages by which he lopes to cause us to stumble. We should study the Bible with humility of heart, never losing sight of our dependence upon God. While we must constantly guard against the devices of Satan, we should pray in faith continually. Lead us not into temptation. This should be our prayer. Lord, help us. Anything that we want to understand about the body, we should go to God and ask for help. You see, men, philosophers, scientists, they all tr they're all trying to have a full understanding, but as inspiration say, the body cannot be fully understand. So no matter what they do, they're never going to have all the answers. It says, I know, says the wise, that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it that man should fare before him. We hear that. What a God we serve. Our memory text reminds us that the Lord God found man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. So in this scripture, we are told that God what formed man out of the dust of the ground. Then he breathed that breath of life into his nostril. And thus he becomes a living soul. That breath and body together are what makes the soul. So the process of development is the same as in the process of ice making. Low temperature and water makes ice just as the body and the breath makes the soul. Hence, when the breath leaves the body, man no longer is a living soul. No, no more than the ice is ice after it goes back to water. Man obviously has no existing soul after the breath leaves his body. For the body and the breath together makes the soul. And this is something that we need to understand. And as we go further into the lesson, that we are going to get to go deeper at it. So the Lord created man out of the dust. So he made Adam a partaker of his life, his nature. There was breath into him, breathing to him, the breath of the almighty. And he became a living soul. Is the breath of the almighty is what makes man a living soul. Amen. Each heartbeat, each breath is the inspiration of him who breathed into the nostril of Adam, the breath of life, the inspiration of the ever present God, the great I am. This is what selected messages tells us. And I just want us to look a bit when it says the Lord created man out of the dust. He made Adam a partake of his life and his nature. As we go more into the lesson, we are going to understand what he means by he making, you know, a partake of his life and nature. And this we are going to get a bit from in Sunday and Monday's lesson in which Brother Brian is going to take us through. Thank you very much, Mr. Cherry.
Greetings, brethren. Okay, Sunday, a living being. So we know that God created man in his own image. And the scripture says, male and female created in them. And as Sister Cherry just pointed out, what makes a living being, we should all understand that it is the both the body and the breast that caused man to, to, to become alive. So let's, but let's move on to learn more about the depths of what this means for us. Okay, let's look at the next reading. Genesis 1 verse 25 to 27 says, And God made the beast of the earth after its kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let us make man in our image after all likeness. So here we see that God made the animals and the insects, and the scripture says, after its kind. But when it came to the creation of man, he said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. So yes, man was created in the likeness of God, and this is, an, this is very important for us. It shows us that our creation and our Whole, whole life is of greater is an, is, is of a greater standpoint than, than that of the animals. As the Bible says, we made out to lower than the angels. Psalms 8 verse 5 to 9. For thou hast made them out to lower than the angels and has crowned them with glory and, and honor. So we are, our creation is much different from the, how the animals were created. God took special above, it, above the animals themselves, and that's why he made us superior to the animals. And so it's very important for us to understand that having a wrong concept, a wrong understanding of what pertains to our life and this is not God's will for us because if he, he, he created us with superior intelligence so that we can intelligently understand the whole process of our creation and our death. So let's continue to learn more. Okay, inspiration says he endowed him with noble qualities, speaking of Adam. His mind was well balanced and all the powers of his being were harmonious, but the fall and its effects have perverted these gifts. So we see God created Adam perfect. He created man a perfect being, but sin came in and marred that perfect creation. And that is why we are we continually deteriorate we are continually deteriorating up until this day. Our lifespan is less, our health is even more terribly. Our health is even more deficient. So Ecclesiastes 3 18 to 21. The wise man says, I said in my heart concerning the estate of the sons of men that God might manifest them and that they might see that they themselves are beasts or that which befall the sons of men befall it beasts even one thing befall it them as the one died so died the other. Yea, they all have, they have all one breast so that a man hath no prevalence among, above a beast. The wise man is saying when it comes to dying, a man has no preeminence above, above a beast. So we would, we would not 
some would say it, but we would not <clears throat> normally refer to uh, an animal, a dog or a cat, dying and then moving around as a ghost after death. But we do so with human beings. But here the, here the wise man is, is making it very clear that the state of the animal after it dies is the same as is the same state that the that us human beings would revert back to. And and so he says in this sense a man has no prevenance above a beast. So if the beast dies and is no more, then according to the scripture, we could logically say that after we die, we are no more as well. So we do not exist as some spirit and roam around. He says, I'll go on to one place. All are of the dust and I'll turn to dust again. And so he asks the question, who knows the spirit of man that goes upward and the spirit of the beast that goes downward to the earth? It makes it very clear. Both of them go the both of them, when they die, they go to the same place. The body goes back to the earth and the spirit, the breast, goes back to God. So the spirit does not roam around immortally, doing as it pleases for eternity. So inspiration, you see, first tells us how man was created and what he is like. Then it asks point blank. Who know the spirit of man that goes upward and the spirit of the beast that goes downward to the earth? The only answer that can be given is that no one knows but God. And since he has told us that the body and soul together, not apart, make the soul, then it is plain that a dead man has no soul, that the body returns to the dust and the breath returns to, to breast, to wind. Moreover, whatever, whatsoever befalls the same, the beast, the same befalls the man. They both have one breath, the clear inspiration, and the one has no preeminence above the other. So here we see that there are three elements in the creation of humans. Body, the dirt, body that was created from the dirt, the breath, the spirit of life that was breathed into his nostrils. And then there's the living being, which is the soul, that is a combination of both the body and the breast. The, the body and the spirit, the dirt and the breast. The inspiration says that the supreme rule of the universe, God has ordained laws for the government, not only of all living beings, but of all operations of nature. Everything, whether great or small, animate or inanimate, is under fixed laws which cannot be disregarded. There are no exceptions to this rule, for nothing that the divine has made has been forgotten by the divine mind. But while everything in nature is governed by natural law, man alone as an intelligent being capable of understanding its requirements is amenable to moral law. To man alone, the crowning work of creation that has given a conscience to realize the sacred claims of the divine law and a heart capable, capable of loving it as holy, just, and good. And of man, prompt and perfect obedience is, is required. Yet God does not compel him to obey. He is left a free moral agent. But here we see all the qualities that God created man with. We know that we are created for a, a higher purpose. So we, we, we need to think about the fact that in our life, we're not able to do all these wonderful things that we, we say spirits are capable of doing. Tell us the future do supernatural acts like flying, walking through solid objects. Can you imagine when we're alive, when, God, when we have all these wonderful things God has given us, when we have our body and our spirit, 
and our intelligence, all that, we're not able to do all these things yet. When we die, when we reach to that to a lower state, because that, because that is a lower state compared to life. Is it logical that when we reach such a lower state, we're able to do all these miraculous things? Certainly doesn't make sense. So there's no need for the enemy to deceive us on this point. And the scripture says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If we fear God and trust in him, he will impart knowledge and wisdom to, to us, to help us to understand these things in their true character, the, the proper understanding of our creation and our death. What happens to us after death? We need not be deceived by the enemy as they deceived Eve. Leading us to believe that we, after we die, we continue as a spirit living on immortally. So I pray these thoughts are impressed upon our minds and we consider them as a means for us to understand the true state of our death, what happens after we die. I turn back over to Sister Cherry. Thank you, Brother Brian. You know, a lot of things stood out here for me in on, on the Sunday's lesson. It says, God created man in his likeness, but the animals were not created in God's likeness. Hmm. But so when Christ died, which means when Christ died for our sins, he died for the sins of man and not the sins of beasts. Because we cannot reason with beasts. Which remind me of the, the scripture that says in Matthew 10, 30, are we not more important than the sparrows, brethren? Are we not more important? We are. So as you rightly said, Brother Brian, we don't come back in any other form of anything. Our bread goes back to God. It doesn't come in the form of a beast, nor does it come back to roam and to hunt man, as some can imagine that they do. <laughs> so we know that Satan is here. And all of these things came about too, because people believe that there is a hell and people are in hell burning for eternity right now. So how can Satan be on earth and still be in hell? How can he be in hell burning? And he's up here on earth and with his evil angels tempting people and causing havoc upon the earth. Is it that God is throwing people into hell and have Satan up here who is the origin of evil walking up and down deceiving people? All of these things man do not reason in their mind. Oh, God is not like that. Who would burn the most in hell? Satan and his evil angel, they will spend the longest time in that fire. So, these are some of the things we have to look at. This is what Satan wants us to believe, that he is in hell with a, with a pitchfork tormenting um, souls. But we know that none of these things can find their place in God's word. Nowhere. Nowhere in inspiration. Amen. So the floor is open for anyone who would like to give a comment or a contribution or maybe even ask a question. I have a comment. I really like the part where he mentioned that... Um, if in life we couldn't do these supernatural things, then how could we do them in death? Mm -hmm. And I think about those people who um who were murdered. If their spirit had come back to, well, if there was a part of them alive when they had died, if the spirit was there roaming around, then half of the crime problems would have been solved or even all of them. Because those especially who had seen who murdered them would have come back to tell the authorities who did it. And so we know that this is 
plainly a deception of the enemy because what he does is cause people to believe that their dead loved ones are protecting them or you know they may come and tell you that um yes. you can win the the lottery by buying this number or that number and so on and so forth you never tell them anything that is to really benefit society and a whole but something that you know would benefit them personally yes. and people love to to people love to realize personal benefits you know especially money house and car and these are the things that these dead loved ones usually come back to say to people so you know brethren we have to really put our thinking cap on and not only that we need to rely on the word of god it is our only safeguard the word of god thank you very much yeah i just want to add also sorry ecclesiastic uh 9 5 to 6 said for the living know that they shall die but the dead know not not anything neither have they any more a reward for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love and their talk and their hatred and their envy is now perish. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. Amen. So here we see here uh, for that which befall the son of man befall the beast. And as Brother Brian um, brings it out there. So the thing is that no matter what man say, the word of God stands forever. And that's the only thing that we have to depend on. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So we are going over to Monday's lesson, which Brother Brian will take us too quickly. Okay, yes. Thank you very much, Sister Cherry. The soul who sins shall die. This is what God made clear to Adam and Eve, but what the, what the enemy has perverted to serve his own evil purposes and cause our fall. If we realize, we, we realize that this deception is what caused our fall, we can understand why it is dangerous to continue harboring it today. He said, you shall naturally die. And when we say that after that, we continue living as a spirit being, we are saying the very same thing Satan said, that we shall naturally die, even though God says we shall die. Okay, let's move on and get more into understanding what this actually means for us. So Paul made it clear that everyone is subject to death because of sin. Every living being is affected by death, both animals and humans, as Ecclesiastes makes clear. When we lose the breath of life, we become a lifeless body. We are no longer living beings or living souls. Therefore, therefore, every soul will die, the just and the wicked. It's inevitable because sin, as the moment sin entered into the world by us, we became subject unto death. However, the just will become immortal souls, people at the second coming when they will be resurrected. So just so we understand, as I believe many, many of us may, the soul that sinned it shall die is not only speaking of the physical death that we'll face here on earth, but the eternal death that awaits us, awaits the soul that continues in sin to the end of its life, to the end of its human probation. So the wicked will become dead souls when they'll die the second eternal death in the lake of fire. As Matthew and Revelation brings out, Isaiah 40, verse 6 to 8, the voice said, Cry, and he said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, grass, and all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth, 
the flow of David. Say this, because the Spirit of the Lord blew it upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass wither it, the flow of faith, it, but the word of our God shall stand forever. So here is Isaiah is making something very clear. Just as the grass withers and fades and dies and is no more, so it is when we die as well. But the word of our God shall stand forever. Here we see the only thing that stands forever pertaining to us, the word of God. So the word of God is the only mortal thing in this life, this mortal life we're living. So we do not continue living in no spirit form. That would mean that we're immortal as well. It's the word of God that stands forever. We do not. And it makes it very clear that the soul that sinned shall die. The only one who promised Adam life in disobedience was the great deceiver. We all know the story, so we won't go through all of this reading. So the divine sentence that says the soul that sinned shall die, Satan turned around and said, you shall not surely die. An inspiration here makes a very solemn statement. It says, we cannot but wonder at the strange infatu infatuation which renders men so credulous concerning the words of Satan and so unbelieving in regard to the words of God. So inspiration causes a strange infatu infatuation. It's not normal. It's something that is very strange that us, man who are created in the image of God, would, would find the words of Satan so credible and have so much disbelief in the words of God. Oh, we would point men to the cross of Calvary. We would bid them look upon him whom their sins have pierced. We would bid them to behold the Redeemer of the world, suffering the penalty of their transgression of the law of God. The verdict is that the soul that sinned, it shall die. But on the cross, the sinner sees the only begotten of the Father, dying in his stead and giving the transgressor life. All the intelligences in earth and heaven are called upon to behold what manner of love the Father has at this tool. So here we see the wonderful sacrifice that Christ made on the cross for us. Inspiration is reminding us of. And let us think about this. If after we die, we continue in this state of in this immortal state, this, this spirit form, continue, continue on immortally, immortally, then why did Christ have to come and die? If we look at it, brethren, goes right across the belief that we continue living after death in the spirit form. And furthermore, if after this, and we continue as spirits, we have these wonderful gifts. The power of flight, telling the future, even walking through walls. Then why, why isn't it that we are better off dead? Looking at it, if I gain these wonderful gifts after death and I continue living as a spirit being, immortally where nothing can kill me or harm me from there on, then isn't life in that sense better than death? And we know logically that we would not agree with this. We would say we love life. All, in most of us love life and love living. If we were to die, no, we would not want to die. So if we truly believe that after death we gain all these wonderful abilities and we live on forever, then why do why not why not die the sooner the better? Would why not reason that it's this it's so the sooner the better we die, it is uh, more beneficial for us than living. Let's think about this, brethren, because of very important thought to ponder. Okay, I'll turn it back over to Sister Cherry.
I pray we all consider these things. Amen. Thank you, Brother Brian. I like the text, um, Matthew 10, 28, that it says to fear, fear him that what can kill both body and soul. Amen. You see, I know this is going to come out a bit more Thursday's lesson, but the only beings in heaven are those that have a form of body, right? Elijah was caught up in a chariot of fire. He never died. He was taken to heaven. So he has his body. Enoch was taken to heaven. He never died. But Moses is in heaven, but Moses died, didn't he? Did Moses' spirit go to heaven? What did God do? He came down and resurrected his body and then take him to heaven. There is no spirit form in heaven. These things are what the devil has come to deceive. When God speaks one thing, he comes to mingle it with another to deceive many. And as it, the reading says, it says what? You, have, you, ha, you shall not surely die was the first sermon ever preached upon the immortality of the soul. Yet this declaration, resting solely upon the authority of Satan, is echoed from the pulpits of Christendom. And we, we, can, we, we know, even as Seventh-day Adventists, now that we have come to know the truth, all your part of our life, they have all these superstitious things that, you know, spirit will come in with you and the spirit of the person whose funeral you went to and these things. Any being that you see looking like the person who died is Satan, evil angels. It's not the person themselves because the, the, the word of God is clear concerning death. Amen. Are there any more contributions before we go over to Tuesday? Yes. There is a point that Brother Brian made that really, um, I really like. You know, he said, if we had these supernatural powers when we are dead, then the sooner we die, it would be the better. We should really be looking forward to death, but nobody really wants to die. So it is showing us there that people do not really, people are not really thinking. You know, they jump onto the bandwagon. Yes, we allow the enemy to deceive us, but we do not think and reason for ourselves. And God has given us reasoning powers. He created us with that superior intelligence. So, but we are failing to use it as we should. We are failing to use it to give him honor and glory, but we are using it to, to give the devil honor by believing his dissensions. Thank you. Amen. If there is no more, Sister Akins, please take us to Tuesday. Thank you very much, Sister Cherry. And brethren, I am truly happy to be here with you again to share in the Sabbath School lesson, very interesting lesson we have here, which we need to really understand as far as the Lord permits us. We have heard before that we will not understand human nature. Because only God can understand it. We will have a little. We cannot understand it fully. And whatever he has revealed to us, we should try to understand. Mm -hmm. So we are looking at Tuesday, the spirit returns to God. And it says there in the lesson, we should keep in mind that Ecclesiastes 12 1 to, well, that is what we are studying. Ecclesiastes 12, 1 to 7. We have already looked at Ecclesiastes 2, 7. Much has already been said on that. We know that the soul that sinned shall die. And we know that God created man in his own image. So or we form man from the dust and all of that. So let us look at Ecclesiastes 12, 1 to 7. But our verse, our main verse, verse we are focusing on is verse 7. In the lesson we learned, we read, we should keep in mind that Ecclesiastes 12, 7 describes the dying process of all human beings and does so without distinguishing between the righteous and the wicked. If the alleged spirits of all who die survive as conscious entities in the presence of God, then 
are the spirits of the wicked with God? You see, friends, we need to really consider these things. It could not be. This idea is not in harmony with this, the overall teaching of the scriptures because the same dying process happens both to human beings and to animals. Death is nothing else than ceasing to exist as living beings. As stated by the psalmist, you hide your face, they are troubled. You take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. We have heard that in Sunday's section and on Monday. So let us continue now to learn more about what happens when the spirit returns to God. All right, Ecclesiastes 12, 7 says, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. And when we look at, we can compare this to Genesis 7, 22, which says, All in whose nostrils was the breath of life, of all that was in the dry land, died. So here we are seeing that without the, not without the breath in the nostrils, man is dead. In, yes. The spirit is not a conscious entity of human beings that keeps living after death. It's God's breath of life. He gives it and he takes it away. So, inspiration says here to us, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Ezekiel 1820. We did learn that earlier. Satan has made that to mean that the soul that sinneth, it shall not die, but live eternally. We cannot but wonder at the strange infatuation which renders men so credulous concerning the words of Satan and so unbelieving in regard to the word of God. You see, as I said before, we give honor to Satan instead of giving honor to God by believing his word. Satan has always tried to make us believe that we won't die. He suggested that a specific part of our being, the soul, remains conscious after our body dies. Does this statement match what the Bible says about human nature and death? No, it doesn't. There is no part of man alive after he is dead, unless the only time when man, a dead man can live is when God decrees. And we will turn the page and see what we can learn from Ezekiel chapter 37 concerning this very subject. You will remember that in Ezekiel 37, Ezekiel was taken to a valley of dried bones and the Lord had asked him the question, can these bones live? Ezekiel didn't know. So he said, God, you know. In verse five, we read, well, before we get to verse five, in the conversation, God had said to Ezekiel, go and tell, talk to these dry bones. And in verse five, he said, this is what Ezekiel was to say to them. Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. You see that, brethren? These bones were dead. And God said, tell them, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. So here again, we are seeing that the body plus the breath equals the living. And if when a man dies, we put our hand or we put a mirror over his face, over his nostril, and we do not see the vapors. We know that he is dead. We feel the pulse. It's not beating. We know that he is dead. The breath has gone from him. In Ezekiel 37, 6, we read, the, the conversation continues. And I will lay sinews upon you and will bring up flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and ye shall live and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Here we see that the process is the same as in the creation. The body is made and then the breath is added. But in this case, God is using the bones 
And so he said he will put the sinew on, then he'll put the flesh, and then he'll put in the breath. And so the dead bones will become live again. In verse 37, in, sorry, in verse 9, Ezekiel said, then he said unto me, prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man. Before that in verse 8, and I'm encouraging us to read the chapter again. Ezekiel had spoken to the bones and he had watched them coming together, the ankle bone to the, all the bones coming, you know, together in their rightful places until the body was shaped again. So now in verse 6, the Lord tells him what next to do. And he said, prophesy unto the wind. Sorry, in verse 9, prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus said the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. Verse 10, So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood up upon their feet, an exceeding great army. So, brethren, here we see, here we learn that the process of resurrection is the same as the process of creation. First the frame of the man, then the organism, the flesh, the skin, and last the breath. And again he becomes a living soul. Man's soul or spirit you see is not called down from heaven or up from hell. In fact, not a soul at all, but wind from the four corners of the earth fills his lungs at the command of God, and thus he again becomes a living soul. So we know of a surety that when a man dead, he stays dead. Nothing of him is alive until God decrees that he should live again by the resurrection. I hope you have been blessed, Sister Cherry. Thank you, Sister Higgins. I, I really love, I'm loving the lesson, just as I enjoy last quarter. And I love Ezekiel 37. Thus said the Lord God unto these bones, I would cause breath to enter in you and you shall live. They cannot live without that breath. They cannot exist without that breath. And it reminds me of Job chapter 14. I think it is verse 14. Where Job says what? If a man die, shall he live again? Because Job believed after he died, he would live again. So he said what? Though you slay me, I will live again. He had that hope. And this is the hope that we have. That we would live again when God is ready. Not before. Not continuously. These are the lies of Satan. And when you believe that a soul goes to heaven or goes to hell, you're saying if a man committed a, say for instance, he murdered somebody, he just he willfully murdered somebody. That's the crime that he have committed, that God would have him burning in hell even now. Till he comes, take us to heaven, spend a thousand years, and he's still long there burning then our God is a wicked God. But we know our God is not a wicked God, that he's a righteous God, that these things come from the lips of Satan and many people believe. We should not even wish for people to go to hell. Leave judgment to God. But sometimes when a person dies, whether he kills somebody or he live a wrong life, we say what? He flying high. But no, brothers and sisters, these bones shall stay dead until God say life shall enter into them. When the righteous shall come up, they shall come up with what? Immortality. But the wicked is going to come up the same how they went down, with the same deformities. The word of God tells us that. So I'm very thankful for the six seconds. Brother Bond, any comment, Brother Brian? Yeah. Go ahead, brother Bond. No, 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 no. Okay. Yes. I'm just looking at something that I think it's good that we consider as well. Because there's also another unscriptural belief which we are which we 
which we bind to as well from the enemy, that after we die, we immediately go to heaven or hell, depending on our life, if we live the righteous or wicked life. Now let's compare that with the belief that after we die, we we continue living as spirit beings. If after we die, we go to heaven or hell, how then can we continue living as spirits? Because we actually uh, we 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 could not be roaming on the earth anymore. We'd be at one of the, those two places, either heaven or hell, and especially hell. Let us consider this. We know and believe and understand that when someone is is in hell, they cannot leave hell. So how is it that if after we die, those who are wicked go to hell? How can it be that they are still roaming around here on earth as spirits? If we consider these things, it, it's actually not logical. It doesn't make any sense. But we realize that this is just a very craftily created deception of the enemy. He continues to deceive us as he deceived even the garden. And we need to obey the word of God. To to accomplish what our first parents failed to, to do, to be obedient to every word that proceed out, proceeds out of the mouth of God, because that is our only defense against the deception of the enemy. So may God help us. Brother okay. Bond? Yeah, I just... um. In great controversy, it says many will be confronted by the spirit of devil, personating beloved relative or friends, and declaring the most dangerous heresies. These visitants will appeal to our tenderest sympathies and will work miracle to sustain their potential. We must be prepared to withstand them with the Bible truth that the dead know anything, not anything, and that they and that they who does appear are the spirit of devils. So here we are, it is being shown us directly. It's only those who stand upon a dust set the Lord will not be deceived by the enemy. Thanks. Amen. Thank you, Sister Higgins. Yes, thank you very much. Truly, I am blessed by this lesson. So we are at Wednesday. The dead know nothing. And from where have for all we have already seen, the dead knows nothing. We could stop there. But let's get into a little bit more details. We read Job 3, 11 to 13, Psalm 115, 17, 148, 4, sorry, 146, 4, Ecclesiastes 9, 5, and 10. What can we learn from these passages about the condition of human beings at death or what did we learn because we have already read them so what did we learn all right as we proceed we'll see just how much more we have learned from these but let us remember brethren the biblical teaching of unconsciousness in death should not generate any panic in christians first of all there is no everlasting burning hell or temporary purgatory waiting for those who died unsaved. Second, there's an amazing reward waiting for those who die in Christ. No wonder that to the believer, death is but a small matter. Yes, to the Christian, death is but a sleep, a moment of silence and darkness. The life is hid with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, shall appear then shall he also appear with him 
in glory. So yes, death is just asleep. And do we know when we fall asleep at night or any time for that matter? Do we know when we fall asleep? Do we know what we do while we're sleeping? Do we know how we are awakened or how we become awake again? We do not know these things. The only thing we know is that God is in control. And if we go to sleep and awake, we say, praise God. For we didn't have to awake, but because of his grace and mercy. As we move forward, we learn much more about whether or not the dead knows anything. So what does the dead do or know? For the living know that they shall die, says the wise man in Ecclesiastes 9 verse 5. But the dead know not anything, neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. That's the Bible, and we'd better believe it. So in Job 3.13, we learn they rest and they are asleep. In Psalm 11517, they don't praise God, they are silent. Psalm 146, 4, they don't think. Ecclesiastes 9, 10, they don't work, study, or do anything at all. And so, brethren, whatever we have to do in this life, let us do it with our might and do it unto God. For when we die, there is nothing we can do. We cannot walk through any keyholes. Not now or ever, we were not made to walk through keyholes. And we cannot do it when we are dead, since we cannot do it when we are alive. But does the, is the dead really silent? You may ask. Then didn't Saul speak to Samuel? Well, let us go there and see. In 1 Samuel 28, we learn about the Philistines coming against Israel after the death of the prophet Samuel. And Saul was very much afraid. And so, as usual, he went to inquire of the Lord. Now, the prophet was the seer. And it was the prophet whom he should have gone to, to find out what the Lord has to say to him. But Samuel was dead. So he took upon himself to go to God. The representative, or the representation, which was the Urim, according to um, Samuel 28, 6. It says here, and when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Uri, nor by prophets. There was no prophet to answer. Now what did Saul do? I mean, there was no prophet through whom God was to answer him. And so Uri, which was the representation, could not work for him either because he was not a prophet and it worked with a prophet. Now, Saul went to the witch of Endor to find out what he should do. You see, God was not talking to him, so he found another way. He went to the devil. Now, inspiration says, None can believe for a moment that Satan had power to call the holy prophet of God from heaven to honor the incantations of an abandoned woman. Nor can we conclude that God summoned him to the witch's cave, for the Lord had already refused to communicate with Saul by dreams, by Urim, or by prophets. These were God's own appointed mediums of communication, and he did not pass them by to deliver the message through the agent of Satan. So here we see that Saul was deceived. It was not Samuel who spoke to him. Let us move on to see what more we can learn. Furthermore, inspiration says, the act of Saul in consulting a sorceress is cited in scripture as one reason why he was rejected by God and abandoned to destruction. 
Saul died for his transgression, which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not, and also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it, and inquired not of the Lord. Therefore he slew him and turned the kingdom unto David, the son of Jesse. And we read that in 1 Chronicles 10, 13, and 14, highlighted by the spirit of prophecy. So, brethren, we see that there is no communication to the dead persons. It was Satan himself who impersonated Samuel and spoke to Saul. And if you go back and read, you will see that the message was nothing that should bring Saul to repentance, but something that should bring him down to destruction. Now let us look at another example, Lazarus. We know that Lazarus had died and Jesus had brought him back from the grave. Did he have anything to tell about that experience? Let's read from inspiration. The feast at Simon's house brought together many of the Jews, for they knew that Christ was there. They came not only to see Jesus, but many were curious to see one who had been raised from the dead. They thought that Lazarus would have some wonderful experience to relate. Brethren, do you see that? These were the Jewish people, you know, who were at the feast of Simon. They had come to see Jesus, but not only that, they had come to hear what experience Lazarus had to tell them. Yes, inspiration said, they thought that Lazarus would have some wonderful experience to relate, but they were surprised that he told them nothing. Lazarus could tell them nothing. The pen of inspiration has given light upon this subject. The dead know not anything. Their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Lazarus, though, had a wonderful testimony to bear. However, in regard to the work of Christ, he had been raised from the dead for this purpose. He was a living testimony to the divine power. With assurance and power, he declared that Jesus was the Son of God. So Lazarus was only sleeping. He didn't know what was happening while he was asleep. None of us know what is happening while we're asleep. So brethren, let us not continue to hold this deception that there is any part of a man who is living while he's dead. Let us move further and see what more we can learn about this phenomena. Yes, inspiration tells us none need be deceived by the lying claims of spiritualism. And the verses that we were given to study is enough evidence to us that this deception that this um, phenomena is only a deception of the enemy. Inspiration continues. God has given the world sufficient light to enable them to discover the snare. Yes, brethren and friends, the light is in those scriptures. Please read them again. As already shown, the theory which forms the very foundation of spiritualism is at war with its plainest statements of scripture. The Bible declares that the dead know not anything, that their thoughts have perished. They have no part in anything that is done under the sun. They know nothing of the joys of sorrows or sorrows of those who are the, the dearest to them on earth. My parents has died and there is nothing they could do for me after their death. I had to do everything for myself. Inspiration continues. God has expressly forbidden all pretended communication with departed spirits. In the days of the Hebrews, there was a class of people who claimed, as do the spiritualists of today, to hold communication with the dead. But the familiar spirits, as these visitants from other worlds were called, are declared by the Bible to be the spirits of devils. And I invite you to read these verses that are listed here. And you need also to read again from 
the book of Deuteronomy and Leviticus and Numbers, where God speaks much about these familiar spirits. The penalty of death is also placed upon those who meddle with them. Inspiration continues, but spiritualism, which numbers its converts by millions, which has made its way into scientific circles, which has invaded churches and has found favor in legislative bodies and even in the courts of kings. This mammoth deception is but a revival in a new disguise of the witchcraft condemned and prohibited of old. Brethren, read the scriptures. They are plain. The Bible is the textbook, the manual that human beings come with. Our motor vehicles and other appliances comes with a manual. The Bible is our manual. It tells us everything we need to know about life and even about death as well. And we conclude with a thought from the parable, the, the, the illustration of the rich man and Lazarus and Abraham. Do we believe that the rich man in hell had spoken to Abraham and Lazarus in heaven? No, Jesus used that as an illustration to show us that there is no salvation after death. And we can think of another scripture where Jesus mentioned the trees. Yes. Jesus even, the fact that the Bible even says that the blood of Abel cried from the earth. Do we really believe that the blood cried? No, it didn't. And the trees, likewise, must we interpret that the trees clap their hands? No. These are illustrations. Just as the account of the rich man, Lazarus and Abraham, were only an illustration to show us that there is no salvation after death. Brethren, I trust you have been blessed. Let us take heed at God's word and cease giving ears. God bless you. Thank you, Sister Akins, for taking us through Wednesday's lesson. It was truly a blessing. Just before we go over to Thursday, which I would take us through, if there are any comments or questions before I go forward. Right. Yeah. Um, what I really gather from this is that those who do not study God's word will believe strong delusion. Because if we study the scripture and follow what Christ said to all the prophets, even from the very beginning, and we follow them, then we can't believe that the dead come back to life. So if we truly believe what God's words, and the enemy also will present uh, things to them as he did with Saul, who was supposed to believe in God's word. But when Saul rejected God's leadership, we find here that he have to go, go and look for familiar spirit and the devil provide something for him. So if we are looking for something away from God's word, we will find something there because the devil has something to give to us. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I did not tell my listeners where we found that one about the trees. You can read Isaiah 55, 12. And it states there that all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. And that was only figurative, not practical. Yeah. God bless you. Amen. Thank you. So let me quickly take us through Thursday. Rested with the fathers. This is based on Genesis 25, 8, 2 Samuel 7, 12, 
1 Kings 2, 10 and 1 Kings 22, 40. They have other texts. I truly hope that we are going through our texts in the week. We are spending a little time to go through. But it says the Old Testament expressed in different ways the ideas of death and burial, right? One is the, the notion of being gathered to one's own people. And it gave the example about Abraham, who we are told that he breathed his last breath, right? And he died of a good old age. We are familiar with that. He was full of years and was gathered to his people. Aaron and Moses were also gathered to their respective people. But we'll talk a bit about Moses more just now. What do these texts add to the understanding of death? Because we have been going through death from, from Sabbath, right? And what does the fact that both good, the good king, mm -hmm, the bad king went to the same place at death teach us about the nature of death? And I believe we would have, have some of these answers. This is really what inspiration say. This is what God wants us to know about death. This is what he wants us, all of his people to know and to teach to others about death, right? So Genesis 25, 8 tells us about Abraham. It says what? Then Abraham gave up the ghost and died in a good old age. And all man full of years and was gathered to his people. It was just Abraham time to die. He wasn't sick. Yes, he was old, but old age didn't kill him because it said he was full of years. So he had his strength. It was just his time to die. He gave up the ghost and he died. And he was what? He was buried. Acts 2.29, men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. David had died so long, and here's Paul writing about David and saying what? He is both dead, he's nowhere that you can see him, as some has believed, and buried, and his sepulcher is with us today. We covered that in last week's lesson, where when, when Paul spoke to the Corinth, that some of them, he was very particular how he bring out the thought of death, because a lot of them believe in life after death. But as Christians, as Seventh-day Adventists, we should not have any thought that there is a life after death except that which Christ will give to us at his appointed time. I'm reading from Great Controversy. Nowhere in the sacred scriptures is found that the righteous go to their reward or the wicked to their punishment at death. That throws out the question or any thought that they're in hell or they're gone heaven looking down or they're over your bedside and all these nonsense the patriarchs and prophet have left no such assurance christ and his apostles have given no hint of it the bible clearly teaches that the dead do not go immediately to heaven if we are saying that brethren we need to stop it they are represented as sleeping until the resurrection. First Thessalonians 4.14, we can look at that. Job 14.10, because Job did ask the question, if a man die, what? Should he live again? If you read on, even on to verses 21, you're going to find a bit more. In the very day when the silver cord is loose and the golden bowl broken, Ecclesiastes 12.6, man's thought perish. It perish. The good thing is, is that when God is ready to resurrect that man, he wakes up with the last thought that he had. So if your thought was bad, that is what coming up. I mean, that is not so much of a good thing. But for the righteous, it's a good thing. Right? In the desert, in loneliness and discouragement, Elijah has said that he had had enough of life and he had prayed that he might die but the lord in his mercy had not taken him at his words and we say that sometimes lord i wish you could just take me now it's time I i'm ready to die I'm ready to go home you really want that well elijah was saying it but god didn't take us for what because god knows if he to really do what some of us truly ask 
But the Lord in his mercy had not taken him at his word. There was yet a great work for Elijah to do. And when his work is done, he was not to perish in discouragement and solitude. <laughs> not for him that descend, that is to descend into the tomb, but to excel with God's angels to the presence of his glory. So when you die and you are buried, the Bible referred to it as what? Descending to the tomb. Amen? But when you ascend with God and his angel, it is called what? Ascend when you go up. And we know that Elijah did, Elijah did not go down. Elijah never died. Elijah was taken to heaven in a chariot of fire. God did not leave him to perish even after he prayed that he might die. And we spoke about Enoch. He never died. Who else never died? So these are the three accounts that God gave us here. These three people, Enoch, Moses, Moses died. He was resurrected by God. We, we did that a bit more. I'm going to talk about it again here. And Enoch, who never died. Elijah, Enoch, Moses. But then it have those of... I ain't going to go to it yet. So let us look at Job 14, 21. His sons come to honor and he knoweth it not. And they are brought low, but he perceiveth it not of them. So they that go down to the grave are what? In silence, they know no more of anything that is under the sun. Blessed rest for the weary righteous. Time be it long or short, it is but a moment to them. They sleep, they are awake by the trump of God to a glorious immortality. They died as mortal. They stay dead until they, God resurrect them to immortality if for the righteous but for the wicked as we had the wicked king and the righteous king it's the same they both go down in silence and look at how god is merciful that both the wicked and the righteous are resting in their grave until the time for them to receive their reward Aren't our God merciful that many of our Christians believe that they are burning in hell forever and forever? Hmm. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. As they were called far from the deep slumber, they began to think just where they cease. Hmm. The last sensation was the pang of death. The last thought that they were falling beneath the power of their grave. And we do feel that way, you know. Somebody who is going to die, just like Christ on the cross, when he cry out and say it is finished, and he bowed himself and died. When we are going to die, we have this feeling that we are dying. Our body is weakening. So it said the last sensation was the what? The pang of death. The last thought that they were falling beneath the power of the grave. When they arise from the tomb, their first glad thought will be echoed in the triumphant shout. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave. Where is thy victory? Never say, oh hell, where is thy sting? Huh? They come up from their grave. They are not in heaven, you know, as some believe the righteous are. That God is going to bring their spirit back down and they're going to say they have triumphed. If they were in heaven all the time, they would have said that already. Why they would repeat that again? All of these things are some of the things that we have to look at. And now we're going to look at prophets and kings. From the beginning of Jehoiakim reign, he's the wicked king, 
Jeremiah had little hope of saving his beloved land from destruction and the people from captivity. Yet he was not permitted to remain silent while utter ruin threatened the kingdom. Those who had Those who had remained loyal to God must be encouraged to persevere in right doing and sinners must, if possible, be induced to turn from their iniquity, which Jehoiakim didn't do. He was the wicked king in comparison to Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a good king on the other hand, but both of them died and are in their graves. Amen? Let me read that again. During his ministry, Jesus raised the dead to life. He raised the son of the widow of Nin, and he raised Jairus' daughter, and he raised Lazarus, right? But these were not clothed with immortality. After they were raised, they continued to be subject to death and decay. But those who came forth from the grave at Christ's resurrection were raised to everlasting life. They were a multitude of captives who accepted with him as trophies of his victory over death and the grave. So this add to Moses, Elijah, and Enoch. A multitude were resurrected when Christ's tomb opened up. When that earthquake, we'll find it in Mark. If it's not Mark, it's Matthew 26, reading from 51 and onwards. When Christ was resurrected, these came up clothed with immortality. Inspiration went on to tell us they came from all ages. We covered that already. Some were giants. They went into the city. They went and they preached about Christ. <laughs> they went, they showed themselves. And these went to heaven. So we have a great multitude who went to heaven. A multitude, sorry, that went to heaven. And we have Elijah. Enoch and Moses there already. These are who are in heaven. Anyone else who died are still in their grave. Their breath go back to God until God gives it to them again. We, we find the story of Moses in Jude 1 9, where it tells us that Christ did not retaliate. We are familiar with this. His burial and resurrection. We recently did this. We recently did this when we started. When we talk about Jude 1 9. He brought no railing accusation against him, but raised Moses from the dead and took him to heaven. Here, for the first time, the power of Christ was exercised to break the power of Satan and give life to the dead. Here began his work of making alive that which was dead. Thus he testified that he was indeed the resurrection and the life, and he had power to ransom those whom Satan had made his captive, that all though people die, they will want to live again. But we know Moses was dead, and now Moses was resurrected and had eternal life. This is the answer to the question, when we say, when Job asks, if a man die, shall he live again? This is the answer. The first resurrection to take place was Moses' body. Satan claim, came to claim the body of Moses when he died because of the one, that one sin. But Christ was there. And it says what Christ did not retaliate in answering Satan. He brought him what? No railing accusation against him, but what? He raised Moses and took him to heaven. When Christ is ready to resurrect the righteous, he is going to raise us up and take us to heaven. And this is the hope that we all should have. So I'm going to go straight over into Friday and then I'm going to take any questions on Thursday. If you have ever been in a surgery, let me read this. If you have ever been in a surgery and were put out with general anesthesia, you might have faint, have a faint idea of what it must be like for the dead. I can testify of that. I went through a surgery. And when I received that anesthesia, I 
was awake for a while, probably for the first 50 seconds as I count. And then there was nothing again until after I awakened. I started opening my eyes. I have no idea, no feeling of what took place. This is some this is what this is the example it is given of death. So I say, imagine what it would be like for the dead. When all brain function, everything has totally stopped, the expression in death then is to close their eyes. And as far as each dead person who ever lives is concerned, the next thing they know is either the second coming of Christ or his return after the millennium. And we want to be in the resurrection of the first. We, you do not want to be in that of the one after the millennium because we know that is for the wicked. Amen? If it were true that the souls of all men pass directly to heaven at the hour of dissolution, then we might well covet death rather than life. And Sister Akins brought this out. If you go to heaven when you die, mama has gone up there, she's flying high, she's looking down then all of us should seek death from this wicked world, right? Many have been led by this belief to put an end to their existence. When overwhelmed with trouble, perplexity, and disappointment, it seems an easy thing to break the brittle tread of life and soar away in the bliss of eternal world. Nowhere in this, as it says, nowhere in the scriptures, you can find that. I read an article this week of two gangsters. One telling the other that let us go out, you know, and kill people. And if we die, it's better off. He heard that the afterlife is better than this. This is the false hope and deception that the enemy places upon humans. And we are to listen to God rather than man. So I end here today. Okay. Yes. Yes. It's just beautiful to know that. God has given us directives in his word because he cares for us and he knows that the enemy had come down with great wrath to deceive us, to perplex us, and to cause us to lose the eternal reward which shall be for the, the righteous. And so studying these, these passages, you know, it has given me even greater motivation to continue studying the words of God so that I can form that righteous character that I need to enter into eternity. And I would just like to implore us all, our viewers, our listeners, to take God at his word, study no more than ever before. Because God desires to save us. And it is only as we study his word that we will understand the plan of salvation, that we will understand our duty and be saved in his kingdom. God bless you. Thank you, Sister Akins. If there is no more, are there any more? If not, we are going to close, bring the curtain down on the Sabbath school lesson today. And ask Sister Akins, Please give us that closing prayer. Okay. Our loving Father and our God, we are truly thankful for this wonderful privilege sitting at thy feet learning of thee. We thank thee, Lord, for all these revelations in thy word. We ask of thee to please help us to set our minds on spiritual things, to set our hearts to study thy word, to live them in our daily lives so we can be saved from the deception that the enemy has out there. Lord, Please hear our prayer and may thy spirit guide us through the rest of this day and the few remaining hours of our lives. We give thee thanks and praise and honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bye from Sabbath school. Goodbye, brethren. God bless you all. <laughs>